Hi everyone, I cannot believe that we are on module 10, which is the last module of this second unit where we go through all these different cultural lifeways from all these different Alaska native groups. And you know this old saying, sort of, you know, we've saved the best for last, or last but not least. Um, I think this is a really good module, I think it has some really interesting things. We're going to be talking about the Iyak, Haida, Tlingit, and Simshian peoples, with a particular focus on Haida and Tlingit. So part one, we're going to introduce those peoples. Part two, we're going to talk specifically about Klingit people in relation to uh, reciprocity, the attack on Angoon, and traditional ecological knowledge. Part three, we're going to be talking about Haida peoples, particularly in relation to language revitalization. So first part, introducing Southeast Alaskan native peoples. When we talk about Iyak, Haida, Klingit, and Simshian, there are four groups that tend to be grouped together. So not just when you know, crazy old Professor Dunstan is teaching this class, but I think a lot of the people that teach this course will often include these groups together, or at least Haida, Klinga, and Simshian often get lumped together. Um, and if you were to read like a textbook that sort of talks about Alaska Native people um, group area by area, they'll te these will tend to be kind of lumped together. And in some ways that makes sense, and in some ways that doesn't make sense at all, and it's pretty stupid. So let me talk about why it doesn't make sense at all and why it's stupid, and then I'll talk about why it does make sense and why it's actually. Um, if not brilliant, at least sort of logical. So first of all, why it's crazy to group these groups together. Um, because they're very linguistically and culturally diverse. Iyak is often considered to be its own culture area. I don't just mean its own culture, which is true of all four of these groups, uh, but I mean its own culture area. So just like we considered Athabascan, to be sort of this big overarching category covering a lot of nations and you know we talk about how there's kind of eight different main huge culture areas in Alaska. Yak is one of those right even though it's a very small group in a very small area it's considered to be so different from its neighbors that it's really kind of a culture area unto itself. Not only that, but they're all really linguistically distinct. Uh, so one could argue that Yak is related to Athabascan uh, uh, if you believe in a theory that's called the Na Dine language group, which would kind of be a bigger language family than the Athabascan language family. But even then, Iyak and Klinga, even though they're both part of this Na Dine thing, they're totally different branches. The languages are substantially different from each other. Tsimshin is over way off by itself as kind of its own language family unto itself of a few thousand people. And then Haida, the oddball of the group in a sense, is a language isolate. So language isolate is a really odd and beautiful thing that happens sometimes in languages where you get a language that linguists can't figure out what else it's related to, uh, which kind of goes against how languages are supposed to work. Languages are supposed to branch off from each other. So I always find language isolates really fun because I like things that challenge anthropologists and prove us that we don't know everything. Uh, so we're not really sure where Haida language came from. And that's really cool, but it is an isolate. So these are four really diverse groups that somehow get lumped together. Um, this is sort of a map of those groups, by the way, here's Iyak, traditional territories, Tlingit, traditional territories, Simshian, which are largely in British Columbia, but also partly in uh, kind of bordering on and slightly into Alaska, and then Haida people who um, are partly in British Columbia and partly in Alaska, which again, I hate to sort of beat a dead horse, but here I go beating a dead horse. One of the points I made last time about uh, Guishin applies here as well, in the sense that you have a group where colonial borders do not reflect, settler borders do not reflect indigenous borders in the sense that Haida people were spread all over this territory, but the U.S.-Canada border kind of cuts their lands in half. And that's the same with Simshian, and to a lesser degree with um, Klingit as well. And this is sort of the geography of this area, by the way. And this is another way in which it doesn't fully make sense to group these groups together because they actually, although they kind of all are in this same stretch, this same stretch is really, really long, right? This is like hundreds and hundreds of miles long. And not only that, but it's pretty diverse in the sense that this all is kind of what you might call straight coastline. That's, um, well, straight coastline, right? Uh, whereas this is basically island coastline. It's what we are calling complex coastline here. And I should say credit to my colleague, Diane Hansen, who um, some of these images are from her slides in these couple of slides here. Uh, but they do all share kind of this coastalness, although it's very different from each other. And they also share, especially once you get down here, 
that we're talking about lands that receive a whole, whole, whole lot of precipitation. Uh, this is really, really, really like temperate rainforest, kind of coastal islandy kind of stuff. Looks a lot more like British Columbia than it looks like Fairbanks. Let's put it that way, right? Now, why does it make sense to group these groups together, even though they're so culturally and linguistically uh, different, and even though they're spread out over hundreds and hundreds of miles, they are still geographically united, right? By Alaska, Alaskan terms, they're still all part of kind of the same area, even if it's a huge area, uh, that area being Southeast Alaska. And not only that, but partly as a result of that, they're kind of united by a specific type of history with U.S. colonialism. And what I mean by that. Uh, is that during the Russian time period, Sitka, down here in the southeast, played a very prominent role within Russian attempts to colonize and extract furs uh, from the Pacific coast of North America. And not only that, but once U.S. colonialism had started, once U.S. Uh, had purchased Alaska from Russia, this obviously became a very, very important uh, area with a, for, for Alaskan terms, rather high population density in parts of it uh, because you have places like Juneau and Sitka, right? And so, and, you know, the capital of the state. So there is definitely some like kind of shared experiences as far as despite seemingly being remote from the rest of Alaska, sort of also being a hotbed of um, different settler groups at different times. Also united by some shared cultural trends. So you're going to see, for example, um, art forms that look very similar to each other in Southeast Alaska, at least to an untrained eye, right? To folks that are not particularly well attuned because you're maybe not from that cultural background. Um, you'll see some distinctively kind of Northwest coast is what we would call this if we were a little bit further South or sort of Southeast Alaskan types of art forms. Um, totem poles being one that you kind of see with several of the Southeast Alaskan groups as a way of marking uh, clan identity, leadership identity, and sacred stories. And so, you know, you have some cultural things going on there. And then you also have the fact that most of these groups I'm um, not really kind of including Yak here because a lot of them would be part of Chugach Regional Corporation. But for Shinge, Haida, and Simshian, most of those folks would, if they are part of, if they are shareholders in an Alaska Native Regional Corporation, it's going to be Sea Alaska, uh, this further most south of the 13 regional corporations. Now, so a lot of uh, folks, even though they were diverse historically and are still diverse, are kind of belonging to the same regional corporation that's representing their interests at the state and federal level. Now, to kind of make that a little bit more complicated, though, just to throw the, this to the side, we've talked a lot about in this class that we have um, tribal lands, but they're corporation lands, uh, which are fee simple lands or private lands in a way that's different from sort of trust lands or classic reservation lands in the lower 48. So even though we have tribal governments, we don't have sort of the classic reservation model of the lower 48. That is true 99.9% .9 of the time. The 0.1% of the time that it's not true is with the Tsimshian group down here. Uh, there's the reservation of Metlakatla, which was um, a pre anxa reservation that got grandfathered in essentially to the current system. And so that's actually kind of a reservation in the classic sense where it would be sort of in trust and with an, um, that kind of relationship to the federal government. So I'm droning on a bit here, but all of that to kind of say that as diverse as these groups are, it makes sense for cultural re for some broad cultural similarities, for some broad geographic similarities, and perhaps the most importantly because of the way they're currently represented within the state of Alaska by Sea Alaska, it kind of makes sense to talk about these groups together, and that's what we're going to be talking about today.